So what's the deal with the Bible and how do we know that we can trust it? Um, I'm Dan Stevens. I'm the youth pastor at Parkside Church here in Camas, Washington. And I'm making this video mostly for my students. Uh, this is a very old discussion. I'm not really going to add any new material and it's not going to be very technical. But uh, in case you're not one of my students, feel free to ask me more questions. You can find me on Facebook or Twitter. I'll put some links underneath the video at the bottom. Um, if you are one of my students, ask me questions. Ask your parents questions. Ask Pastor Darrell or ask your senior pastor wherever you're at. And uh, have a discussion about this. So to get to the question, the Bible is actually 66 small books. It's, it's more like a miniature library. It was written by a lot of different people, about 40, and it was written in two different languages. It was originally written in Hebrew and in Greek. And the, the range of stories in the Bible, it goes mainly over the, the political and religious history of Israel. And then when we get to the New, the New Testament, it tells us the story of Jesus and of the early church. But against those stories as kind of a background, the main story of the Bible is the story about a creator that made the world and made some rules, and then sinful people that broke those rules in spite of the consequences, those consequences being separation from God, a, a disfellowship with God, physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death. And then of God making a way through Jesus Christ to restore fellowship between himself, the holy God, and with those sinful people, and to make it possible for those sinful people not to experience spiritual death and eternal death. So most of the time when people are asking the question, of, can we trust the Bible, they're, they're going to ask a couple of different things. One, they're going to ask, how do we know that the right books got picked, that the right books got included into this big book that we have? And how do we know that the originals were preserved well and translated well, and then if, if people are sinful, fallible, and not perfect, then how can we trust people to be a part of that process and, and then call this thing God's Word? So I'll, I'll try to take those one at a time. Um, how do we know that we got the right books? There's sort of two separate answers to that. There's one answer for the Old Testament, those covering uh, the, the history of Israel, and that's all the Old Testament, the, the Bible story before Jesus. And it focuses on Israel's political and religious history. And to make the cut for the Old Testament, basically the book had to be written by the high priest, one of the prophets, or uh, one of the, the kings of, of the United Kingdom in Israel. It was uh, before Israel separated into two, two separate kingdoms. So the, the first prophet that we see in the Bible is Moses, and God validated him or proved him to be legitimate by the miracles that he did through Moses during the story of the Exodus. And the first high priest that we have in the Bible is Aaron, Moses' brother. And any future high priest would be validated by the approval of the prophet or the judge at his time and by tracing his lineage back to Aaron. And then the kings, the only two kings that actually contributed to the Bible were David and Solomon. Solomon was David's son, so uh, a monarchy, you know, the king goes through the bloodline. Kingship goes through the bloodline, so Solomon didn't have anything to prove. But because David was taking over after the death of Saul, who is not David's father, some things had to be done to prove David's legitimacy as king. And a lot of what happened, were th the main things for what happened to prove David's validation were three different anointings. Uh, an anointing is a religious ceremony. The first anointing that David got was a private anointing from Samuel. This is Samuel acting as the prophet for Israel. and This is actually before Saul died. And then after Saul died, there was a second anointing that was more public, but it wasn't the whole country yet because Saul had still uh, one surviving son who was ruling the northern part of the country and claiming to be the king. Uh, so there was that second anointing after the death of Saul, and then after that, that guy in the north was taken care of, there was a third anointing that validated David as the king of Israel, of the, of the entire country. So the, those books were, were 
written down and collected and validated progressively through Israel's history. And then the New Testament books, they had to be written by uh, somebody who was an eyewitness to the, the ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus. So pretty much one of the, one of the apostles, one of the disciples. Uh, it had to, have been, had to have been a book that was circulated widely or very common in the New Testament church. And it had to have been a book that was received as authoritative, meaning that the, the leaders in the church and most of the congregations would get the book, they'd read it, okay, yeah, this is something good, and they wouldn't toss it out. And the other thing to be picked for a New Testament book was that it couldn't contradict the teachings of the Old Testament or of the New Testament books that had already been confirmed. Um, so that's a human process, but I'll, I'll get to the, the, the God piece of it later uh, in just a minute. The next question people will, will often ask is, how do we know that the, the books of the Bible will, uh, were preserved and translated correctly? So on the preservation issue, there's a lot of technical discussion there, some archaeological discussion. Um, I would point to Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And to avoid the technical stuff, I'll just summarize his discussion. Basically, if you compare the Bible to any other ancient book, like Homer's Iliad or uh, the, the Gaelic Wars by Caesar, uh, the, the Bible comes out on top. It's been preserved much better and more accurately than any of those other ancient books. Uh, so we can say with better than a 99% certainty that the oldest manuscripts or the oldest copies of the books of the Bible that we have are as good as the originals. And that can't be said for any other ancient book. That can only be said for the books of the Bible. On the translation issue, there's, there's a few different ways to translate the Bible. There's the, there's a, you can translate it in a dynamic way so that you preserve the, the big ideas at some cost to the original words. Or you can translate it in a formal way so that you preserve the original words at some cost to the, the clarity of the big ideas. They're still there, but because we're going from one language to another, the, even those ideas are there, they might not be as clear. So it's often helpful to, to study multiple translations of the Bible. Uh, one example of a dynamic translation is the, the New International Version, and a good example of a formal translation is the English Standard Version. So if you were to study those two together, you'd get a good comprehensive picture of, of what the Bible is teaching and saying. Um, the third way that the Bible is sometimes translated is in a, in a biased way. It's not a dynamic or a formal way. It's somebody is translating it to, to show their agenda. Um, the, the Jehovah's Witness translation, the New World translation, is an example of that. Uh, they've, they've translated, or ha they claim to have translated the Bible in the correct way, but they won't offer like the credentials of the people that they use to translate it. They won't give any citations, so they're not giving any proof that there was good scholarship, good studies that went into that translation. And if you compare them to other translation, there's some really screwy stuff in there. So that would be one to throw out, the New World Translation. Um, and that's, that's because it was translated in a biased way. And that also brings us to the last question. So if people are sinful, fallible, and imperfect, then how can we trust people to do this process of, of picking the right books, preserving the, the books as well as can be done, and then translating them as honestly as can be done? And the answer is you can't trust people. Uh, but you can trust God. Now, I believe that you don't necessarily need to read the Bible to believe that God exists and that God is sovereign, or meaning that, that he's in control of all things, even if he's working from behind the scenes. Some people think you need to read the Bible first, but then you get into a, I read the Bible to learn about God, and then because I believe in God, I, I read the Bible, and that's called circular logic. Um, I think there's enough in nature that can convince me that 
there's a God, that there's one God, and that he is in control, even if he's taking control from behind the scenes and he's not directly active in everything. So I trust God to have superintended or watched over that whole process of picking the right books, preserving those books, and then translating them. It might have been helpful to answer that question first, but uh, the reason I wanted to answer the other questions first was to show that the bar was set pretty high. So even for sinful and imperfect humans, it's, it's difficult to get to the standard that we have that gave us the Bible. So that's my answer to the question, can we trust the Bible or what's the deal with the Bible? Um, I know that I'm not adding a whole lot to the, the general discussion. I'm making this mainly for my students here at Parkside. So if you have more questions, ask me, ask your parents, ask your youth pastor, ask your senior pastor and have a discussion around the Bible, the message of the Bible, and uh, what it means for daily life. And I'll see you next time.